Um, first, I'd like to express my appreciation to Karen McDonald, our prosecutor, for the charges that she just announced, which I'm sure you were at her press conference. I agree with the charges that have been levied. I agree with holding this individual wholly and completely responsible for the deplorable, tragic event that occurred by choice. And uh, so we, we appreciate her stepping up quickly um, and charging this individual as an adult, which I have said from the beginning of this, I believe is most appropriate. You also know we put out a release, sadly, the 17-year-old fourth victim passed today at McLaren Hospital shortly after 10 o'clock as our fourth uh, decedent to die from gunshot wounds in Tuesday's senseless shooting. Uh, you already know the other three tragic victims and thankfully we're learning more about them and, and hopefully we'll honor their memory, not just with the charges, but to talk about their life and what amazing young people they were. You also know seven other people were injured. I'm gonna update you on their status. Six students, one teacher, four remain hospitalized, three have now been treated and released. A 14-year-old male remains in serious condition with uh, GSW gunshot wounds uh, to the jaw and hand. A 17-year-old female with neck uh, wounds. She is at the uh, a m local area at McLaren Hospital. A 14-year-old female has improved, thankfully. Um, I would say no small part to great medical care, emergency uh, responders, fire service, and prayers. Quite frankly, the public, she's been removed from critical to stable with gunshot wounds to the left chest and neck. Uh, she's at Hurley Medical in Flint. And uh, we have a 17-year-old female that still remains in critical condition with a gunshot wound to the chest, so still looking for prayers and support for her and her family. Uh, the following discharged was a 15-year-old male who had a wound to the left leg, a 17-year-old male who had a hip gunshot wound, he was discharged, and a 47-year-old uh, female teacher that had suffered a gunshot wound to her left shoulder was discharged, as you already know. Uh, again. And the charges levied by the prosecutor uh, were supportive of, including one count of terrorism causing death, uh, because very clearly there were a lot of victims in that school other than the ones that were actually struck. Um, and then in addition to that, she charged four counts of first degree murder, seven counts of assault with intent to do murder, and 12 counts of felony firearm. Uh, our detectives right now are in the car on the way to District Court 52-3 for a swear to to the facts and allegations contained in these warrants. And after those are sworn to, we anticipate that a video arraignment from Chitterland's Village direct to the court will occur. And we are asking and uh, joining the prosecutor to ask the judge that this individual be transferred to the Oakland County Jail from Children's Village. Uh, so we, we hope that the judge rules on that as well. <clears throat> I'd like to update you on some of the information. Uh, this is still evolving, right? <clears throat> it's a crime scene. We've still got a ton of interviews to do, video to review, documents to review, search warrants that have been completed that have to be uh, examined in terms of content and items that were seized. So sometimes things evolve. When I said last night that he had seven rounds left, he actually had 18. Seven were in his pocket that were loose. So he had an additional uh, rounds in an actual magazine. <clears throat> Excuse me, so he had a total of 18 live rounds left. We have recovered 30 spent shell casings at this point by processing the scene, meaning he fired more than 30 shots. More to the point, again, I think it highlights the fact that with this much ammunition, still with him, 18 live rounds, um, the quick actions of the school and the lockdown, uh, as well as the deputies getting in and, and going to the sound, <coughs> going to the danger, save lives. That doesn't minimize the loss or the tragedy, but it's important that we continue to look for ways to prevent these, and if they ever tragically happen, how we can mitigate 
and reduce that tragedy. The suspect, we believe at this point, now had three 15-round magazines. Two were initially recovered by investigators, and after a thorough forensic examination of the crime scene, which went until 5.30 this morning, another magazine was recovered. <coughs> As I mentioned, the crime scene was searched and processed until 5.30 this morning and has now been turned back to Oakland, excuse me, Oxford schools. <coughs> We're coordinating counseling and therapist efforts with CareHouse to assist all Oxford community schools. And we also have an offer for a crisis team from the FBI and we're grateful for that assistance. I would remind and encourage anyone, whether they were there or feel traumatized by the event, it is strength to seek help, not weakness, that trauma affects people in dramatic in sad ways and asking people for help, seeking a therapist or a counselor or a chaplain is an important step to process such a tragedy. Also, I wanna clear up some of the incorrect information that keeps circulating. Social media keeps ginning up a great deal of false information. A video was disseminated rather wild, wild, widely that showed the students in a classroom and depicted someone knocking on the door and pretty much the allegation was that that was the suspect. We've now been able to determine that was not the suspect. <coughs> Excuse me, more than likely it was one of our plainclothes detectives and he may have been talking bro in a conversational manner to try to bring them down from the crisis to say, come on bro, let's get out of the classrooms, let's get you outside, let's get you that kind of comment. The suspect we have now confirmed by analyzing all of the video from the time it began to the time we took him into custody, never knocked on a door. So uh, the other thing that we are seeing um, that we have heard on social media was that again we were notified about this threat in advance, false, the threat that we were notified in advance was one from November 11th that actually we did investigate and it was determined to be from Georgia, not Oakland County, and had no relationship to Oxford schools and was cleared as such. That is continuing to be cross-populated to this event. It has nothing to do with this event. So people are posting, I called the sheriff's office about a threat it was a different set of circumstances that had nothing to do with this individual or the facts at hand. There were two events that happened, uh, fairly close proximity and timelines and the locations to Oxford. Both of them had nothing to do with this. We received no information about this individual prior to the shooting. We also were told that the school had some information or some contact with the individual. We had no information from the schools, but we have since learned that the schools did have contact with the student the day before and the day of the shooting for behavior in the classroom that they felt was concerning. In fact, the parents were brought in the morning of the shooting and had a face-to-face -face meeting with the school. The content of that meeting obviously is part of the investigation, but we did not learn of that meeting nor of the content of that meeting until after the shooting and during this investigation. So please, I remind everyone, be wary of social media and what's spread because it's hurtful to the community, it's hurtful to the victims, and it spreads false, sad misinformation. If anyone has information or believes they know something about this case, or frankly any case, or any potential threat anywhere in Oakland County, please call our phone line that we've given out before at 248-858-4911, or you can email us at OCSO, Oakland County Sheriff's Office, OCSO at OakGov. Dot com and of course we always accept uh, anonymous tips so 
I'll try to answer questions if it doesn't get too deeply into the evidence because we're right now at the baton point where we're passing the baton from investigation to prosecution and we don't want to say anything that may jeopardize that furtherance of the case. Um, secondly, <clears throat> one of the victim's families um, has been getting a great deal of contact from the media. They don't want to talk to the media. And they're feeling bombarded in this unbelievable moment of pain. So we would ask you to leave the family members that lost loved ones alone. And the, the father described it as wolves at the door. And they're dealing with the loss of a child. Let's not victimize them again, please. Sheriff, on the victim who passed today, um, multiple ages have been given, 17. 17. Uh, prosecutor just said 15. 17. 100%. We verified it via driver's license. Thank you. Sheriff, can you confirm that the suspect, if the suspect was at school and then left and then came back? <coughs> to the Is that true? The suspect was at school and did not leave, was brought into a meeting and then went back and uh, into the school area. I can't I can't get into that again we're at the evidentiary handoff point but um, is that information that should have been relayed to the liaison officer or anybody? we always prefer to err on the side of too much rather than too little um, I can't really go much beyond that but we would rather as I said yesterday, check out a thousand nothings and miss one real deal. Is that going to be investigated? Is the school going to have to potentially answer questions? Well, it's certainly part of our investigation, and that's where we learned about it. Sheriff, you were in school with the face to face with his parents. Was he in a meeting with them back on the day of the shooting? Yes. And the parents left, but he stayed in the school. Yes. Do you know what time in the morning that might have occurred that face to face? Uh, shortly after 10, I believe. So between 10 and almost 1 o'clock, right? The, the shooting was at Close to one, right? Correct. 1252 or thereabouts with first call came in or was dispatched. We're hearing that he went into the bathroom. He loaded the gun in the bathroom before walking out to shoot. Can you confirm that? I can tell you he came out of the bathroom with the firearm and began shooting. I can't tell you if he loaded it in there. Any updates on the motive just yet, Sheriff? No, we are obviously are not communicating with the suspect, so we can't get that from him. We're working, you know, items that we have seized, as I talked about, documents, papers, phones, evidentiary value, items to look to see if there's something that would lead to us understanding what motivated him. But I will say again, there is nothing that he could have faced that would warrant senseless, absolutely brutal violence on other kids. And I have also asked the school if they have any records of him being bullied, and the coordinator of anti-bullying programs had no information that he had been bullied by anyone. The prosecutor talked about premeditation in her estimation, but was not able to clarify whether it was premeditation of certain victims. Did he go there with the intent to just kill, and these people were randomly targeted, or is there any indication they were specifically targeted? Uh, we have no indication that these, these students were specifically targeted. And based on what I've seen, I don't think that's the case. Was the meeting with the students, uh, was there any discipline that was discussed that you know of or just discipline that was decided in that meeting? I, I really don't want to get into the specifics of that meeting because now it's part of the investigation. But I wanted to be transparent that we learned that a meeting had occurred and we did not know about that until after the shooting. Was he ever expelled from school? No. He, prior to those two meetings, there was no contact and nothing in his file by either concerning behavior or discipline. In the investigation, how, how is it interacting with the parents of the With the parents of the child? Of the suspect. Yeah, well, they've, they've apparently hired an attorney, so we're not talking to the child or the parents. I understand you're saying that threats were not reported to your office, but as we go through the digital evidence and the writing, how clear or specific were 
you know, I really don't want to get into ultimately what will be disclosed at trial sure. and, and what we cover, recover in terms of documented evidence. In debunking social media misinformation, can you address some of the rumors about a countdown being displayed on one of the social media accounts, something that was out of the day. That's the first I've heard of it right now. So again, there's so much out on social media that we've spent a lot of time investigating and, and finding there was nothing to it and debunking and it's causing us a great deal of resources and it's causing the victims more harm and more hurt. Is there any indication that the suspect has been treated for a mental health condition or is seeking treatment for a mental health condition at this point? We have no information about that. There are photos of his proximity to the victim, but what was he within, if, if the kid walking down the hall? Very close. He was very close as opposed to Very close, right? very close. Jay, I know, I know all of this happened within school. like a five minute, but is, is there like a timeline that you can give us as far as where the shooting started and the direction or avenue that he took? Um, again, I don't want to get too awfully specific into the actual elements he came out of the bathroom began shooting moved through hallways and back through hallways and was apprehended in the hallway never went into a room he was in the hallway the whole time and i have one more question sir. <clears throat> did he ever spend any time in a mental facility at all do we know that not that i'm aware of are you aware of the shooter going to a, a gun range in the days before the event to, to train with the weapon or get familiar with it we're told by different people that he had. Um, there's some social media posts that allege that. Uh, we have not had the ability to verify at this point if there was a range or if that happened. And that's, again, I mean, understand the scope of this. The, the school has almost 1,800 students. And so everybody that was in school that day, we have to contact to see if they saw, heard, or knew anything. And we have to review every bit of video footage from all of the cameras in that building, which there is an extensive camera system, thanks to the proactive work of Oxford schools. And I'll also say on the proactive side, we've worked with Oxford schools, our liaison taught them in Alice. That saved lives. And after going through the scene last night and seeing it in a very non-rushed fashion, those practices were used and they saved lives. Desks were upturned, doors were barricaded, doors were actually hit by gunfire and so were barricades, but the doors were safe. So that behavior, that training, and those protocols saved lives. When was the last time there was a training at that school? Was it for teachers or? I believe it was just prior to COVID, maybe 218. Sheriff, you talked at length last night, today, about the training. 219, 218, somewhere in there. Forgive me. You talked at length last night, today, about the training of, of your team, of the kids going through drills, but no mention about uh, gun legislation, maybe trying to do things upstream to prevent these types of occurrences. The prosecutor talked about it a oh. half hour ago. Do you have anything you want to share in your view in regards to? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think I have the feeling a lot of law enforcement has. We have a whole lot of gun laws that are meant to hold criminals accountable when they commit a crime, when they use a gun, when they carry a gun illegally, and they're not utilized today. And that's one of our constant concerns around the country. I'm head of government affairs for major county sheriffs of America, and we see this across the nation. We catch somebody illegally with a gun, and it's pled down to a misdemeanor, and they're out. We've had people, you know, that have been, been charged with gun crimes three and four times. I believe the surest way to get a handle on holding people accountable when they're doing things illegally with a gun is to punish them. And that's not happening in many communities across America today. There is a NICS background check. When you go in to try, attempt to purchase a firearm that requires you to go through this, there is a huge number of people <laughs> that are prohibited from buying that firearm, that are caught by the system, that are never prosecuted for trying. We have gun laws in place. We're not holding people accountable. We have felony firearm in Michigan. I'd like to see anybody that's caught illegally possessing and using a firearm in a criminal manner should get felony firearm and do hard time. If we're gonna hold people accountable, 
Let's hold the criminals accountable. Is there anything in the father's history that should have precluded him from being able to buy that firearm? Not that I'm aware of. Sure. How frustrating is it to, I know you mentioned that you guys have been trying to talk to the suspect and his parents, they're telling them not to talk. How frustrating is that for you and your deputies and your investigators? I believe, regardless of what the parents or the, the individual suspect does, our investigators are well on the path to create a very, very good case to hand the baton to the prosecutor. Sheriff, I have one more question about the actual shooting. Uh, in a crowded hallway in school in close proximity, did the initial victims even know what was going on when they were shot? The reason I'm asking, I'm a, I'm a parent with kids in school. Sure. And I know how kids walk through a hallway. You always tell your kids, you know, keep your eyes open, be careful. But if a kid is walking next to you behind you, but you don't know his or her intentions, there's not a whole lot you can do. Did the initial victim who was shot, did they actually know what the heck was going on when it happened? I would have to say no. Oh, sure. So we were told that there was a uh, female retired deputy who was helping out at the school yesterday. Do you have any more information on who she is and how she was able to help out? Uh, their private security is employed by the school district in addition to us having a school resource officer that covers Oxford schools. Um, I, I know some of them were there yesterday. I'm not sure all the specific ones. Um, so we really don't want to get into identifying personnel at this point, but there were private security people employed by the school, and I know at least one or two were there yesterday. Sheriff, the prosecutor said, I'm sorry, she said it's being considered or looked into, but from where you sit with the evidence you found, do you see any potential criminal negligence on behalf of the parents? I think that would have to be a TBD as the investigation to be determined um, as the investigation unfolds, and we present it to the prosecutor, and then she'll make the decision. Sheriff, how did the gun get inside the building? Uh, you know, it's speculative, obviously, but my guess is he carried it in, either in his backpack or in his waist. Sir, can you, and I, and I apologize for the repetitive question, can you explain again the meeting of that morning and the day before? It was a meeting with his parents about his behavior? The day before, it was a meeting with school personnel about some concerning behavior, and the meeting the day of was with school personnel and parents. About the same issue? about a different issue. What was that issue the day of? I, I, I really can't go into the specific issues on either day, but two different meetings happened. Can you give us any insight into his mental state? There was, obviously he's on suicide watch. If he's moved to a, a county jail, will that be continued? Are there concerns about that? Well, typically any time we have somebody with a, with a active participating role in a tragedy such as this, they're put on suicide watch just to ensure that nothing happens. Um, so that that's kind of SOP standard operating procedure and absolutely if he gets transferred to the Oakland County Jail, that will happen. There have been a number of copycat threats throughout the county today. I Sadly. The are already beyond busy, but I assume that, that has already taxed your, your resources. Yeah, uh, no, spot on, Ross. Yeah, there's, there's um, it's some weird anomaly. Every time something like this happens in the country, there's a whole bunch of copycat threats and texts and pictures, and, and it really burdens law enforcement all across the nation. We're actually in schools today investigating what we think are part of that incredibly disturbing trend. Um, and that's, that's again, it, it raises the level of anxiety of parents, students, and teachers in schools that had nothing to do with this individual incident, but are now feeling very much anxious and tied to it. And that's how it, it broadens this whole anxiety and, and depression that many parents and students are feeling. And it's incredibly disturbing. And so when those kids or whoever we find out call in or do these text false threats, you know, as you've seen us in the past, we attempt to get charges on them. Even if it's not a credible threat, the mere threat is a crime. And if you make a threat, we're going to seek charges. Again, apologies on the redundancy. No evidence of bullying from where you sit right now, correct? I specifically myself asked the school district. They had no information in any of their records that he had been bullied, and we have had no information brought to our attention from any other source that he had been bullied. Thank you. Sheriff, the, uh, 
So it's like we have been planning this meeting for a while. Um, do you know if the FBI was aware of any of this prior to you participating? At this point, I, I'm not aware any law enforcement agency had him or the school on their radar for this particular incident at all. For this particular incident, what about previous incidents? Or any incident involving him. Okay. He wasn't on any law enforcement radar that I'm aware of, certainly not ours. We had no communication about him or about anything that was pending, and I haven't heard from any law enforcement agency that they did. Was the suspect a gamer? Did he have any video games? Apparently, he was interested in games. I, I can't really comment on what those were at this point. That obviously is something that will be looked at as well. Sheriff, sure, is the belief that he took the gun illegally or was given the gun illegally? That was part of the investigation. In any event, he had the gun illegally, took the gun illegally into a school, and used the gun in an illegal and murderous fashion. So. We've got a whole bunch of charges already, regardless of how he came into possession of it. Any clarity you can give on his uh, familiarity with weapons, perhaps uh, gun range use, et cetera, in terms of his background and familiarity with, with guns? I don't know much beyond uh, what we saw in evidence in the school, and that will be part of the investigation, obviously. Uh, with this particular weapon, it's our understanding it was purchased four days ago. so. Uh, this particular weapon, probably not a huge amount of familiarity with. But over the years, other weapons? That's part of the investigation. What's your perspective on the terrorism charge, <coughs> the, the impact of that message it's going to do to me? I agree 100 percent. You know, if you weren't hit by a bullet, doesn't mean you weren't terrorized that day and won't have nightmares about it the rest of your life, whether you're a parent, a teacher, or a student in that class. Um, you know, going through that, that building in the wee hours of this morning, uh, looking at the disarray in the classrooms and the backpacks strewn across the floor, that had to have been an absolutely terrorizing moment in anyone's life. I don't care if you're an adult or a child. How much more time do you expect on processing at the school itself? Are you, are you pretty much done? We're pretty much wrapped up with the physical processing in the school, not necessarily the evidence that we obtained from it. There's a search warrant executed at the parents' house. Are there additional properties that you're, you're looking at that require similar searches? We did seize some property at the house and our detectives are going through it. So I think I mentioned this before. We've got a lot of different bundles here that we're fortunate to have under our own roof. We have our own crime lab, so they're processing things as it relates to the scene and items uh, that were seized there. We have computer crimes looking at any kind of digital evidence, including uh, his phone. You know, we have detectives looking mm -hmm. at any potential documents or other things that may contain information or uh, things relative to, you know, some of his thoughts. Maybe it may be contained in some of that. So a lot of those things are kind of spanned out to all of our different specialists and then they'll be brought together under the officer in charge of the case and relayed to the prosecutor. Can you give us any details on, on what was seized or maybe the volume of material that was seized? I, I can't get into the details of what was seized. I can just tell you we have a voluminous amount of stuff and things to do. Stuff to go through and things to do. Sheriff, I just have one more question and I believe you answered it previously so I apologize for that. Um, when your your investigators will they have a, a follow up conversation with the school in regards to why you you guys were not informed about that meeting or his, um, his behavior? C certainly, our investigators will be and are in close contact with that school, and we're in close contact with all schools in Oakland County. And we encourage all schools, public or private, houses of worship, businesses, anyone that has any concerning behavior, they should report it. Allow law enforcement the opportunity to make the situation safe, to say there's nothing to it or we need to look deeper. That's what we want to do. It's not a burden. So we encourage people, wherever they are, if they're concerned about something, let us know or let your local police know. The term concerning behavior, does that constitute threats in specific? I don't want to get too awfully into what 
was concerning because then I get into the actual content. But, you know, it's, it's one of those things if, if someone looks at it and you go, oh, that doesn't seem right, whether it's threatening or disturbing or maybe they're worried about, you know, someone being bullied or suicidal. We have uh, obviously a huge problem in America with suicide, especially teens. If they see something that may cross into any of those realms, it needs to be shared so we can figure it out, A, if it's a threat to anyone else or themselves, and B, where to get help. Does the school indicate why they didn't share the concerning <clears throat> behavior with your office? Um, that's all part of our discussion with them. Yeah. Yeah, did he know about the meeting with the school officials and his parents that morning? Did who know? Did the, the defendant, I'm sorry, did, um, did Crumble, the teacher, did he know that he was going to be meeting with school officials and his parents? No, he was brought into the meeting and his parents were called. Okay, okay so I'm asking because that, did he ever leave the school after that meeting? No, the not. The was already in school. So still, I, again, it's still a moving, we believe it was. I can't definitively say 100% that it was, but we believe it was because we've begun the process of tracking his movements and saw at what point and where he came out with the weapon. Thank you. Eric, do you think that some type of red flag law could have helped prevent this crime at all? Or I, I don't even know if something like that even exists for a minor Home or? You know, I, I, I don't necessarily think so. I think the most important thing is to share information because, I mean, for anything, whether what you're talking about or a different process, you have to share. You have to say, this seems concerning. Can you look into it? And with or without that, we would and, and say, hey, what's going on? What, what are you seeing? What are you hearing? What have you seen? And try to determine where it's coming from and where it might lead. Yes. After the meeting in the morning with the school and the parents, did the, did the suspect go back to class? Was he released back to, to class? He was released back into the school from the meeting. Do you have any video of where he retrieved the weapon from, like a locker or somewhere? I, again, the first time we saw the weapon, the weapon actually in evidence was when he came out of the bathroom. So you know, every other moment in time, it wasn't observed. So backpack whether it was concealed on his person or in a backpack or hidden somewhere in the restroom, I, that is all part of the investigation if we can determine. There's been some discussion of metal detectors in schools and whether that would have prevented him from being able to smuggle weapon inside the building. Yeah. What are your thoughts on that? The vast majority of schools in America do not have weapons or metal detectors. Um, and, and, you know, that's a determination for each district about what kind of environment they want to be operating in. But I, you know, I know for a fact one of the last debriefs I got on a school shooter, he came in through a back door. Um, you know, somebody was going out and he came in, walked in with a, with a firearm and began shooting. So, you know, there's, there's tragically nothing foolproof in a world where you have people that want to hurt other people, but again, the best preventive path that we've seen that has worked is to make sure everyone talks about something they've seen, heard, or witnessed so it can get looked into, to put training and protocols in, in place. And in fact, that situation that I just mentioned where somebody came in a door that was a non-traditional door they had radios as a school system all around the building and anyone in the school was empowered to put the school in the lockdown. And so a, uh, a groundskeeper or a janitor, I, I can't remember his actual position, saw the person with a firearm going in the school and called it out on the radio. The school went into lockdown. They still had, I believe, one or two students killed, but everybody else was in lockdown and the police were able to get there before any more perished. So processes, training, communication, that's some of the best paths that we've seen in terms of success. Sure, but you'll be releasing any <coughs> video footage from inside the school? No, at this point that would become a handoff to the prosecutor for evidence. The 14-year-old with a gunshot wound to the jaw and hand has been discharged. Uh, uh, 
recent update, the 14-year-old with the gunshot wound to the hand and jaw has been discharged. Any update on the uh, young girl described yesterday on a ventilator after a chest wound and surgery? I think she's still... She's off the ventilator now. She's off the ventilator, but she's still critical. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Did you guys do sensitivity um, It's probably happening almost as we I speak. It's, right it's going to be a, a video arraignment. So the detective's driving in person to the district court where he's going to swear to the warrant. Then they're going to connect via video and arraign the suspect to that court. Just so we're straight, um, can you uh, relay the names of the folks that are still hospitalized and in critical condition? No, we're not naming the victims that are hospitalized. Um, I mean, even the ones that are deceased were sad to hear that they've been negatively impacted. You know, we had hoped that it would be uplifting and supportive rather than focusing attention that they don't want. At any point in the video, did anybody try to disarm him? Or were people just running from him? Uh, I don't, nothing I saw tells me that, and I'm not sure that we have any information on that front that, that has come to me. So um, the part I saw, there was no attempt. But obviously, when you've got somebody very close firing a weapon, that's not almost anybody's natural response to go towards it other than police and military. And that's with extensive training. Anybody else? Thank you.